All right, in theory, we are live. Hey, everyone, thanks for uh, thanks for coming to the live stream. Uh, you're uh, reaching me here in my lovely home out in Franklin, Tennessee, just outside Nashville. Some people were confused about the time of the podcast because we're typically a California company. I was out there for like 26 years, uh, and a lot of the folks uh, in the company are still out in California, out in San Jose. But uh, I and my family moved out from uh, San Jose to Nashville. Uh, we're just outside Nashville uh, about three and a half years ago. So that's why we're on Central Time now, and I'm um, trying to do this during my work day, which is why we're doing this now, and as opposed to like, you know, 10 o'clock at night. Hope this time works out for folks. But anyway, thanks a lot for coming. Um, Today I wanted to talk about uh, a few of the things that are going on in the comic industry because it's interesting. We don't actually normally have news about the comic industry, but you know today we do. Uh, and then I want to get to some of your questions. So the questions are really the, the main feature here. Uh, and uh, some of the people have posted over email. Uh, I've got a bunch that uh, we have in the chat here. If you're on YouTube, I would encourage you to go ahead and post on the chat. If you see me glancing down nervously like this a lot, it's uh, I'm learning this live stream stuff as I go. And that's me trying feverishly to read your chats as I'm doing other things on the screen. So hopefully, um, you know, work with the uh, uh, <laughs> work with the great level of professionalism we have going on here, and we'll try to make this as good as we can. Uh, anyway, um, so first off, uh, Diamond and, uh, uh, and DC have parted company. Um, we had some rumors of this or some rumbles of trouble in, in on this whole thing back in March. Um, uh, as you guys are all aware, we've, you know, we shut down the world for COVID. And uh, one of the things that was shut down harder than most states actually was Maryland. Uh, just, you know, you know, there's there's regions of outbreaks and local politics and things like that, which seem to dictate who gets hit harder or worse than others. But Maryland was definitely one of the states that got hit pretty hard in terms of having a very you know firm lockdown on their operations. And then, of course, you know, all the comic stores around the country have been closed down. Um, you know, almost none of them are open at this point you know some are now thank god but uh, but it's been very hard to get comics out the door from publishers into your comic shop so um, a couple of months ago diamond had the had to make the decision said look guys we're suspending operations uh for a while because we have no comics we have no ability to run the business um this did not sit well with DC. It, it didn't sit well with anybody, I imagine. But um, but in particular, DC said, you know, guys, we want to do something else. And then they, uh, t you know, it came out uh, in late March that DC was going to partner with a couple of distributors that very few of us had ever heard of before, uh, Lunar and UCS, uh, which, as it turns out, are the um, actually run by Midtown Comics and uh, an outfit called, I hope I get it right, Discount Comic Book Service. Services, DCBS, which a uh, number of us have actually been using to get our comics just through the mail if we don't have a good local store, in, you know, in our district. Um, but anyway, DC was going to be distributing through them, uh, and and I took this at the time when I heard it. I was like, wow! But I took this at the time as this was a sign that DC wanted Diamond to get off the stick and reopen things and get stuff back in stores. And Diamond does, to their credit, seem like they really did their best to get things reopened as fast as it was humanly possible for them to do. Um, but it came out, um, you know, last week that uh, DC is pulling the plug with Diamond. They're pulling out of their distribution deals and going uh, purely through uh, Lunar, UCS, and for their books, uh, Penguin, Random, I think it's Random House. It's a sub-brand of them. Um, so this means a couple of very interesting things for the industry. Uh, for one thing, it means that about 35-40% of the money in the industry just left Diamond. Um, the last time this happened was back in 1994 when... Uh, Actually, 1995, but in 1994, Marvel bought an outfit that was not doing great called Heroes World Distribution. Some of us remember this. Um, and this was a very expansive time for the comic industry. Marvel was definitely on the march. They were putting out tons and tons of series. They bought a bunch of, you know, they bought a card company. They bought a distribution company. They bought a, a lot of sub brands. And Marvel was going to turn into the multimedia conglomerate that we now know and love them as. Uh, but they were going to do it originally. You know, the cinema thing, their first wave wasn't great, uh, but it got better later on it and now it's of course that's the thing that most people when they think of marvel they think it's a movie character not a comic book character if you just ask kids on the street but anyway back in the 90s they were flooding the zone with just all this expansive stuff and someone at marvel got the bright idea said well hey why are we giving up you know you know 60 percent of our you know cut to a distribute you know a distributor we could be you know running it ourselves and, and pocketing all the money so they bought a place called heroes world distribution tried running their comics out of it this sent the comic book industry into a tizzy uh, because there were two distributors at the time. There's Capital City Distribution, which I'm 
very, very fond of. I mean, they, they were good folks. They really treated f people right. They really seemed to, you know, try to do the right things. And Diamond, who I'm also quite fond of. Um, but they were very much rivals. They had, you know, roughly equal market share in the whole thing. And they just saw 40%, you know, when Marvel walked out, they saw 40% of the industry's money leave. So, and they left at it on an exclusive deal. So this led them into this complete tailspin where like suddenly became like, uh-oh, we better lock up the guys who are left quickly because, you know, with two of us, if one of them scrabs all the rest of it, we might survive. But if it's Capital and Diamond are both splitting the market and we're splitting it amongst just these little pieces that are left, they weren't going to make it. So... There was this furious bidding war. If you were a comic book creator in the 90s, you were being, you know, feted and wined and dined like you can't believe if, you know, like the early studio heads over at Image were really, you know, they, they were having a good time <laughs> taking all the phone calls and, and being wooed with everybody. Um, but uh, everybody else was sitting there going, wow, I don't know, man, how this is going to turn out. Well, the way it turned out in the end was DC struck an exclusive deal with Diamond Comic Distribution. My guess, I'm not privy to the inside of the deal, but my guess is, you know, Diamond threw, you know, everything they had at the whole thing and, and they sold they sold the deal this left capital city distribution out in the cold within a few months of this capital city had to pack it in and which i i find is really a shame i, I think most markets work better when there's a couple of strong competitors and because it keeps everybody sharp but uh capital and, and diamond i at the time I, I thought the 90s were a very very good time for just the service to the retailers that they got from the distributors and a lot of that came because they were both trying very hard to you know sell if, if you weren't happy with your deal at Capital City, you go to Diamond and vice versa. Uh, when there's only one, the great risk is that that person's going to get very, very lazy and they're not going to try so hard anymore. And so then, you know, it, it keeps, you know, it, having strong competitors in any market keeps people on their toes. Um, anyway, so DC locked in a, I think it was like a 25 year, it was a very long time uh, uh, deal with uh, Diamond. It could have been 25 years. I'm getting my math wrong, but it's close to that. It's, it's a decades-long deal uh, with Diamond to go to exclusive with them. Apparently, that deal just expired, and so DC then became free to explore other alternatives for where they'd like to go. And in the meantime, DC has also you know, they been bought by Warner Brothers, you know, fully integrated into that whole um, uh, into that whole media empire over there, uh, which has also expanded. There's been a lot of corporate consolidation of entertainment properties over the last 20 years, uh, and their priorities may not be as strongly comic books as they were. Um, there were, and I want to get some shouts. There are people I've known them, just we do shows on the road, you know, you see each other five times a year, just, you know, hanging out and doing conventions across the place. Uh, there's some people in the market who, I just, I gotta say, we're really acting as stewards for the comic industry. Oh, look, and I'm getting... Uh, oh, interesting. It says that we're going to be getting buffering problems. Terrific. Um, well, we'll make do of it. Um, it's my first time uh, doing streaming with buffering issues, so uh, we'll see how this goes. I guess if... I guess the move I've seen with other people is that if this fails, you sort of start and restart the stream, but uh, tell me in the chats if it's getting terrible and and we'll we'll try that um i'm, I'm playing this is my only my second stream i'm doing the best i can on this one um but anyway uh, i i want to say that bob wayne over at, uh, dc very much cared about the comic market he you know he's not there anymore but he was a very long time guy uh, i, I want to say he came in for, as a comic retailer initially um uh, but he was with him for a very long time very much a steward of the industry good guy the guys at capital city good guys steve jeppy over at diamond Real good guy. Um, you know, he just, I mean, even when he's like, you know, the, got the feel to his own, he could have been so much more merciless uh, with comic people, you know, but I mean, he really saw his job as really, you know, taking care of the comic book industry. Uh, he had the ability to shove almost any kind of deal, you know, down publishers as he could have. He has always been incredibly welcoming to small publishers. Uh, the, you know, the number of copies you'd have to sell in order to get a diamond distribution deal was just minimal. And, and despite uh, there's some players in the market who I'm not going to name who were very much of the opinion that you should really tighten that up and make it harder for new players to enter and things like that. Steve was always the guy to say, like, no, I want to give the new guys a shot. Um, and he also was the guy who really looked out for retailers. Um, a lot of the initiatives you see that, you know, we think of as just normal for the comic industry came in under hit, you know, because he did them. Um, the, there are things like the comic shop locator service. Uh, Free Comic Book Day was originally Joe Field out of... Um, Oh, good lord! Somebody in the comments tell me I'm, I'm blanking on his uh, on his uh, comic store. Um, 
but um, but uh, out in uh, I want to say around Sacramento, California. But he came up with the idea of free comic book day, and Diamond made it happen. And it's been like a tradition for almost twenty years now. Uh, Halloween comics, you know, the idea that you know when comics come around, you know, uh, when the kids come around trick or treating, you can hand them comic books instead of candy. I've been doing that in my life for 20 years, just with regular comic books, but starting about 10, 15 years ago, Diamond made it so we could buy packs of comics that were like, you know, 20 cents each and hand them out to people. He made that, you know, just, it was a real emissary for making comic books, you know, a part of people's life, you know, in, in an age where honestly they're getting kind of expensive. So I, I really want to give props to Steve Jeppe because he had a chance to act like a monopolist and instead I think he really has always been into trying to act like a steward of the industry. So, uh, yeah, I, I want to give him props for that uh and now he's got you know an interesting situation because he's back where they were back at the start when marvel pulled out and he's going to make some moves uh i wish them well um one thing that's going to be really interesting about this particular one is uh you'll remember the second uh i, I can now i'm going to get it wrong uh between i think it's lunar yes is really discount comic book services um uh, so now you've got a situation where you know steve jeppy has always been very very careful don't do any moves as a public or as a distributor that undercut the retailer or customer relationship. He never wanted to get in the middle of that um, because he really thought it was very important to keep the comic stores in business. Uh, sometimes he would do things that even made me kind of crazy. It's like, come on, can't you just do this that's more direct? He's like, no, nah, we got to keep the comic shop in the middle here. Um, but that's always been a priority for him, and I respect him for that. Um, but now you've got a player in distribution, discount comic book services, who is directly selling against uh, comic retailers. Um, so this is going to be a tough situation. Uh, I don't envy, I mean, I don't envy being a comic shop owner in the, in the best of times. It's a hard gig. Um, it's a fun gig. It's got great stuff in it, and it's really neat. But it's, man, if you think that's an easy way to make money, you're crazy. Um, it's, you know, we looked in, in the early days of comic, uh, comic Base into what it would take to make a retail version of Comic Base to sell, you know, to like run the cash register and, and manage the inventory of a comic shop in a more integrated way. I mean, there's a lot of things in Comic Base that we slid in to make it happen anyway, but to really deal with like what they have to do to run cash registers and do inventory reconciliation, everything else like that, what would it really take? We looked at what was required to make that happen and we ran away screaming and we're a software company. Um, and we, I've never really regretted that situation for a minute um, because it's just that tough. It, I can't think of a retail thing other than maybe running a wall Walmart that's harder uh, because you've just hundreds of thousands of SKUs. They change in value all the time. Their grade is critical. You can't return them. It's it's nuts from a retailing standpoint how hard it is to make comic shop you know owning work. Uh, how many hours your local comic shop retailer puts into on the job and so forth. And at the same time, they now have to make that all happen with now multiple ordering systems, different discount levels, and that's the best case without the idea of and we're now competing directly against someone who if I give them my customer. Name, are they taking my mailing list? Yeah, I don't know, man. There's a lot of questions that are going to come out of this one, and I don't know all the answers to them. Uh, it's going to be interesting to watch. But 2020, man, this this has been some year, huh? Um, anyway, that's about all I have to say about that right now. Um, I'm going to get back on this later on. It'd be really neat if I could, you know, get in with Steve Jeppy and maybe you know do a call in with him. But uh, I'd love to get his take if he can say anything. Uh, my guess is there's been negotiations behind the scenes for quite a while. This is a big deal. This is cl clearly of critical business interest to everyone involved. Uh, it comes as a shock to all of us, but that doesn't mean that this wasn't in the works for a long time. Um, but, um, you know, I would love to hear more of the inside scoop if that ever becomes possible, and I'll share it with you as much as I can. Um, all right, but like, let's uh, go to your questions. Let me do a quick jump in on the scroll and see what we can do here. Uh, do you think the returnability becomes a component of the direct market? Wow, that's interesting. Uh, so returnability, uh, just to give you guys the concept if you have never heard about it, um, because ties into something that's kind of interesting to me. So you guys might have looked at comic books through, uh, I want to say from about 1984 to about 1995, 1996 or so. Uh, you would look at a comic book in the bottom left-hand corner of it, you'd see either a barcode uh, or you'd see like a little picture of Spider-Man or a Captain America shield or a DC logo. Um, and uh, you might have wondered what that means. What that is, is there's the idea of something called the direct market. The direct market is comic book stores. And the direct market was innovation in the 80s 
where they basically they you know I, I forget who started it and I, I, I honestly I, someone told me and I, I should know this and if Maggie Thompson is on the scroll she she'll you know obviously clue me in on this one but um uh, but the idea was uh, typically when you were uh, when you were selling comic books prior to the 1980s you know, 80s or so what would happen is you'd order them along with like you know your newspapers and your copies of Time magazine and and you know you know your your auto traders or whatever you were doing and the deal was um we would you know get them only at like a 20 percent discount but if we didn't sell them we could send them back and so there was no harm for me to carry it so when you went down to tom thumb or 7-eleven you picked up your comic books if they had the little barcode on the side on the bottom that said it was a, 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 a not a direct market comic book it was a newsstand comic um and that's the way all comics were issued until dazzler number one which i want to say is 1984 uh that was the first direct market comic book and it was terrible a great cover but a terrible comic um but anyway uh that one was the first one where it was distributed under a new term to comic shops and only comic shops um and the deal was this we're gonna send you this thing at like a 60 percent discount but if you don't sell it you can't give it back uh and that's the first one that moved through comic shops to uh through as we call it just you know comic you know direct market distribution and the way they would just, you know, tell them apart from the newsstand ones is they'd put a little picture of Spider-Man or Captain America on the bottom there. And so that way, you know, you would always know that that one couldn't be sent back. If you're really, really old school, some of the really old distributors would say things like, all right, if you didn't sell it, rip the cover off and, and send us the, the insides back and then we'll know that's it. Uh, and so there's actually like a glut, or at least there was a glut back in like the 70s of just comic covers because people afterwards would then, you know, take them and say, this is a new comic cover. And you know, sell that to you know on the back end, and uh, conversely, they would also do things like selling you the comic without the cover, um, uh, because they didn't really return it. Um, but anyway, that used to be a thing. If you went to a comic shops in the '80s, you could see. You don't really see it so much now, but that that was a thing. Um, but anyway, so if you see comics that you know don't have you know don't have the um, uh, the barcode uh, from that era. That's that's pretty much what that's all about. Now, barcodes came back eventually, and, and again, this is another thing I want to give Diamond credit for. Uh, I wanted it was basically right around when Young Blood number one came out in the early '90s. Uh, Diamond said, "Enough of this nonsense. Barcodes are key to running an efficient business. We have to make this happen." And that's when you saw barcodes actually switch their formats uh, from having uh, a little two characters in the bottom left, uh, bottom right half of the barcode, um, which uh, if you cared, if you looked at so your cap of Captain America 187 and uh, your copy of Captain America 199, they actually had the same barcode because those last two characters designated the month of when the thing came out. Now, uh, starting with uh, Young Blood number one and the other comic books that came around in you know from uh, that point on, they all had a five-digit supplemental. It's the you know the digits at the far right of the barcode. And if you ever wanted to know what what that's all about, is those designate, or at least they're supposed to designate, um, the issue number, the variation, and the printing. Uh, which is why if you ever get a barcode scanner and you don't pick up those numbers on the barcodes, uh, typically Comic Base can't do anything useful with it. Uh, so that's more than you want to know about barcodes. Uh, do it now. Back to your question. Do I think that returnability is become going to become a thing in the direct market? God, I, I can't see it because, um, I mean, that's the whole premise of the direct market. But, you know, maybe I, I just don't have that that kind of vision. Um, it would be really interesting, but I I don't know. I mean, I, I think the other thing that's new to the market that wasn't a thing back then, you know, way back when is digital comic books. Uh, I would believe digital as more of a directly competing line. Um, then I would believe that we're going to re-enter the age where I could ship a comic book back. Um, that's another thing you, you might have noticed, uh, and this I think also is going to be interesting, is part of the idea that we don't want to squash the retailer is there was a lot of pressure, uh, and it came through Diamond and, and, and the rest of the folks, to keep the price of digital comic books relatively high and also not to offer same-day sale of digital comic books with the comic book. So uh, I had actually made a, a prediction um, four years ago that it was one of these bets on the future that I lost, uh, which I had said that within two years, the the um, the, the number of comics uh, sold of uh, the latest issue of Spider-Man will be more in digital format than they will be in regular format. Turned out I was absolutely wrong about that one. The 
The reason I got it wrong is because I thought the digital comic books would do what digital songs were doing, uh, where I thought, you know, because digital comic books, you know, were running two ninety nine, three ninety nine, and I thought digital songs are 99 cents. Everyone knows that's the price. Uh, and then the other thing that happens is digital songs, you know, when you release a digital single or you re release a, a CD, they came out, the digital sing single, if anything, came out ahead of the, of the, of the, uh, of the album. Um, with comic books, they always made a point of delaying the... Uh, uh, release of the uh, digital version. Um, sometimes Marvel, you know, they try to, you know, they always, always want to make sure that you sold it at, you know, at, as a physical copy if they possibly could. So uh, a lot for a long time, the I don't know if it's still the case, but like the agreements with say Comixology and folks like that, where that, yeah, you can only you know release the latest issue of Spider-Man or, or you know. Batman or whatever else, a certain number of days or weeks after the physical copies hit the streets. Uh, and then there was a minimum price point. They didn't want to see it go on during the first several months of its sale. Um, I do think this is one of those things that's going to cause a lot of rethinking on that. And it's possible we might see digital comics become, you know, I, I, I think a lot of the old rules are going away. So you might see them go in a different direction that's much more aggressive. Maybe this is great for the consumer. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's bad for comic collectors. I don't know. We're going we're gonna to have to watch. Uh, let me have a quick look at the scroll. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, Dummy Pass. Uh, Pacific. Uh, can you reveal the pro? Oh, okay. Yes. Can I uh, review? Uh, George asks, can I review the purpose of books versus magazines versus comic books, uh, especially as it deals with books about comic books or hard hardcover reprints? Um, okay. So uh, the deal in Comic Base 2020, which is going to be kind of a weirdly named product because it's not just comics anymore. It's comic book a magazine base or something. Um, uh, the idea, you know, as we were saying last time, is we wanted to make it so that comic base could handle things that weren't just you know, comic books, or or we wanted to also give a home to, you know, things that were books about comic books, or magazines about comic books, or frankly, magazines that comic people seem to like reading, like science fiction magazines and stuff like that, because all these things were starting to make their way into the database, and they didn't really fit, and they had different shipping weights, and they had different characteristics, and, and, and we were shoehorning them into the whole thing. It wasn't a great world. Um, so we wanted to give them a way to bust out. And oh, by the way, there's also a secret reason I didn't say much about, um, but is, you know, it was it played in my thinking some. Um, uh, a guy named Bob Bretal, I hope I'm saying his last name right, it has the world record for the Guinness World Record for the largest comic book collection. And uh, we had at some point made contact with each other and he had mentioned one of his problems because you know, he was a comic based customer forever. I, I, I didn't know him because his, his uh, lovely wife uh, was the one who entered all his comic books for him which is a great gig if you're Bob. Um, but anyway, uh, he invited me over to see his comic book room, uh, in, which was amazing. Uh, just I've never seen a nicer staging of comics in in a home environment, you know, uh, in little collections and, uh, you know, of, of all the figurines and memorabilia. It was all just beautifully done. It was it was really museum quality. Um, but uh, one problem he had when the Guinness guys came around and he, you know, because he had told them, hey, I've got a lot of comic books. I think I might have the largest collection of going. Uh, what happens with Guinness is they make rules up for what counts as a collection. So if I have, uh, as one company did, uh, 50,000 copies of Spawn versus Batman number one, that counts as one copy under their rules. It, it, it's only one comic book. They don't care that you have a lot of copies of it. Uh, they don't care if you have a lot of comics, uh, books about comic books. They don't care if you have a lot of magazines about comic books. They wanted to just count single copies of just comics. Uh, and so I told him at the time, I was like, well, you know, that sounds pretty cool. I'd be really interested in, in coming up with a feature which is a Guinness count. Uh, in other words, uh, something which in Guinness specific rules tells you what you've got. And, and I, you know, the idea of, of having books and magazines was kind of like, far in my future at that point. But uh, as we rolled into that one, that's one of the reasons that you see the reporting in company statistics the way you do is it does actually give you a quick way of getting your Guinness count. And at some point, I think it'd be pretty cool if we had our own leaderboard. Um, um, I will talk to the folks involved with that and see if that's if that's something anyone's interested in doing. But um, uh, I'm just saying uh, I have seen other people's collection stats and uh, Bob, Bob's got some people who can give him a run for it. Um, 
yeah, I'm not gonna, you know, but uh, anyway, one of the, so one of the things we want to do is we wanted to separate things that, you know, is it a comic book, is it not a comic book? Now, we also had the idea that we want to partner with Atomic Avenue and make it so it's easier to sell things that aren't books, comics and things, you know, things that are books, things that are magazines, which again, have different weights, they have different packing requirements, they have all sorts of other things like that. So it was important for us to bust out what's really a comic, what's really a book. Uh, now, George, to your question about, you know, how should I classify the books I've got? Um, for us, um, the question of is it a book, is it a magazine, is it a comic book? Uh, it isn't about the binding, it, you know. So it isn't about like it does it come in a in you know a, a you know a, a big pamphlet, a small pamphlet, a hard comf or a pamphlet or whatever else. Uh, to us, a comic book is it's it's panels that tell a story. Uh, if there's if it's just pinups, if it's just you know an art portfolio, that would go into the book section. Uh, if it's a book like Wizard, where you talk about comic books, but you're not really telling a story with the whole thing, it goes under magazines, and that is also where things like, you know, SFX Magazine would go, or Cinefantastique, uh, or in this case, Time, or Life, or whatever else. That makes sense to us. Uh, uh, it also is a book if it's a reference about comic books, but it's not really a reprinting of comic stories, which is why the DC Archives, although they're very book-like, are still listed as, you know, in the comic book section, um, but the, um, but say, for instance, uh, 500 uh, comics you should read before, you know, 500 greatest uh, superheroes, or something like that, that would be listed in the book section. Uh, so that really is the you know, question of, of what type of thing do we consider it to be, is does it tell a story using panels? Uh, and when we have the integration finalized with Atomic Avenue to get those to be able to be posted, that'll be where you see the, um, the categories will match up. Um, okay, so other questions here. Uh, what is the story of the black line going through the barcode? Um, typically, oh interesting, god, Great barcode questions today. So the black line through the barcode typically would mean it's a reprint. Uh, the first time I remember seeing that one uh, it was on Star Wars, but you also saw it on things like Whitman samplers, uh, or not, not Whitman samplers, the Whitman uh, collections. So, um, you know, again, picture yourself being a kid going to the store in the 70s and you wanted to, um, you know, buy comic books. Well, you've got two bucks in your pocket or a buck or whatever you had. I mean, it wasn't, you know, and it, when you see the comic books of the era, when they said still only 35 cents, that mattered to you. <laughs> so, because, you know, I remember going when they went to 40 cents and saying, that's it, I'm over. These things are way too expensive because I'm, I'm doing the thing in my head and I'm thinking I can no longer get three comic books for a buck, no matter how much I take from the penny jar, right? Uh, but anyway, another way you could get more comic books for your, for your buck back then is they would sell, you know, multi-packs. They would sell, you know, take three three comic books in the middle, you know, and they'd put one good comic book on, on one end of the bag, one co good comic book on the other end of the bag, and some really crummy comic book in the middle that you couldn't see what it was. Um, uh, and they would sell that. Uh, Whitman did a bunch of these, DC and Marvel. I, I want to say both did versions of these ones, and they'd sell them as like three comics for only 89 cents, kids. Uh, anyway, so when what the publishers were really doing at that point is they were getting rid of their back stock. They are getting rid of the stuff they couldn't move. Um, and so, and, it, and of course, as, as all of us as kids, what we'd do is we'd take the whole package on side and we'd try to peel it apart with our fingers without breaking the plastic and try to suss out what the middle comic was because that made all the difference. Um, but anyway, um, typically if they were going to have ones that they were going to run through that kind of process, or if they knew it ahead of time, they might have done the slash through the barcode. Uh, other times you just saw ones that if they didn't know it was going to go into that kind of uh, distribution, typically it wouldn't be. That, that's my recollection of what the bar, uh, the bar through is. And if I'm wrong, I'll try to correct it in the future. Uh, all right, so, uh, da -da 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 -da. okay, uh, try converting. All right, so issues with converting between categories. So when you have uh, comics, uh, or, or so, uh, so going forward, we think that when we have a new magazine that enters the system, like, you know, Doctor Who's spectacular series of science fiction magazine, right? That's going to just go in magazines, we're done and done. But what do we do with the ones that used to be tracked under comics? Well, if you've got uh, something in your comics that is now has an entry in magazines, it's not there yet. There's a commanding comic base. And let me go ahead and switch to the screen here to see if I can show it. Um... So if you go and I take, uh, well, let's, let's find, I probably don't have one here, but let's say Action Force by Marvel UK. Let's say that was really a magazine, uh, you know, uh, and I was going to change it, you know, from a, a comic to a magazine category. What I would do here is I would go under Edit, and I would say Change Title Media Type. And let me see if I go, uh, I think I learned how to do this. Give me a sec. If I go, there we go. Uh, so now, 
Yeah, okay, this is less optimal than I'd like because it's on it's on a second screen. All right, I'm gonna. Oh, good grief! All right, I'm gonna abandon the attempt to magnify this one. Sorry, guys, we tried. Um, anyway, give me just a second here. I, I now have to figure out how to turn off the magnification. This is the best. This is professionalism at its at its as hard, isn't it? Um, all right, give me just a sec. Uh, magnifier, magnifier, magnifier. Where are you? Uh, 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 uh. Oh, I'm loving this so much. <sighs> Give me just a second, folks. This is spectacular video here. Uh, so what's happening behind the scenes is I have two monitors right now, and I'm showing you one, uh, or I was showing you one, but when, as soon as I turned on the magnifier, it wanted to lock onto my other monitor, and it didn't want to let go of it for, for you know, anything. And so, of course, it just made me absolutely crazy. So now I need to scroll down enough so that I can see my magnifier in the bar and turn it off because that is terrible and I'm never going to do that again. All right, back to the screen. <laughs> that was great, wasn't it? All right, so let's say I want to take action for us. And I want to change it to become a magazine. So I'd go under here, I'd say change title media type, and I'd say go to magazines. Now, at this point, I'm going to get a message up here, which is probably really hard to see, but I'm not going to magnify it because I've learned that lesson. Um, what it says is change the media type for the series Action Force Marvel, uh, Marvel from comic book to magazine. This will transfer all the applicable information from the old series to the new media type, but information for fields which are not relevant to the media type will be lost. So in other words, uh, comic books have... Um, Oh, what do they have? Uh, comic books have a uh, ISBN number, uh, is one of the things that can apply to a comic book. Magazines do not have ISBN numbers. They have ISN, ISSN numbers, which are a lot like them, but they don't. Uh, comic books have color cover colorists uh, or, co or or co you know uh, or cover inkers. Uh, magazines typically do not, uh, and so forth. So anything that is, there's going to involve some kind of data loss. We'll let you know that, yeah, okay, you know, the things that made sense got transferred, the things that didn't, don't. Um, anyway, there was a point to what I was doing here. Okay, so once you've done this the first time, what you might see when you go over to, um, is you might see then that you've got an entry now with some of your stuff is now, it, you know, it'll move your inventory over to the Doctor Who or Action Force magazine category. Um, but you might see um, that it, it has left over some action, you know, you might have the old title laying around in your comics still, uh, if there were some things that couldn't be transferred. You might see that there were entries, if you had stuff in different conditions, um, uh, in your comics, uh, you notice how all the con uh, conditions in comic base are all near mint. But let's say I had a good copy of you know issue number three of Action Force. What would happen when you looked over at Action Force as the magazine is you'd see they had both a near mint and a good copy now listed. The near mint would be you know quantity in stock zero, but you know but it would look like there's multiple entries. Um, it's not a big deal, and I do think uh, there's actually a way that removes uh, extraneous near mint entries from the database. I'll try to write that up as a tip. Um, um, but what I'd say is don't worry about it right away. Um, but I do want to say next time you go and you download an update after you've done your switching of stuff over, I'm going to give you one tip that'll help you clean up your database. And that is this, is when I go and I do a check for updates, uh, and I say, okay, there's a new content update. All right, you guys are probably used to seeing this screen. Uh, so we've got up here where it says updates to items and values. It says why well, I want to update my guide and so forth. Um, one that doesn't get a lot of love is this one over here. It says allow corrections to existing. Cover dates, creator credits, series info and descriptions, cover prices, storylines, etc. Now, by default, these are all unchecked. It isn't because I think that's a great setting. I, I would strongly encourage all of you to check every single one of those. It's not checked because it involves changing your data, and we never change your data without you explicitly giving us permission to. The idea of what are we ask, really asking here is, let's say that I found out that Batman number 273, uh, well, let's say it was the, the Fall of Scorpio is what we thought it was called, um, but it turns out the real name of that series we find out later is, you know, you know, you know Joker's Revenge, colon, the rise of you know, the Fall of Scorpio. Um, what that lets us do is it lets us go to a storyline that you've already got and change it to what we now know it is. 
Um, now, the reason it's not checked by default is, well, what if you have a really strong opinion that your data is better than our data? Well, we're not going to change it without you letting us. Uh, that's why we don't have that checked for, by default. But we do encourage you to check those things because, it, it, frankly, it lets us make corrections. Uh, and we make thousands of updates and corrections every week. It's a good thing if we can give them to you. Um, uh, so I would encourage everyone to you know check these off when you're doing your updates. And then down at the bottom here, Here's another one I want to strongly encourage you to do, which is also, you know, not there by default. Uh, it's a couple of options that say remove obsolete series if they have no items in stock and remove obsolete items if they're not listed as being in stock. Now, again, by default, they're unchecked because we never take away or alter information in your database without your consent. But man, I would encourage you to do this one because what this really is doing is it says, Look, if we found out that there was a title out there which was solicited as something, let's say it was a new Nightwing series, it was going to be called Nightwing, you know, the storm in, in Gotham or something. Um, but it turns out when it comes out, someone at DC changed their mind and they just decided to call it Nightwing, right? Uh, at which point it probably becomes Nightwing 6 series for us, right? But we've already solicited, we've already put it out on the strength of them soliciting it as Nightwing, a storm in Gotham. That's already a new title that came down in your updates to comic base, right? What this lets us do is, is let's us get rid of that for you. Um, so um, anyway, so what we're going to do here is, and I'm going to switch back to me here because I, been, you know, talking here uh, too much, and, and I, I want to give show you my face. Um, anyway, what this lets us do is it lets us uh, get rid of our mistakes, frankly. Or if it was solicited under one title and we had to change it, it lets us get rid of the one that's not operational anymore. Now, the limit on that is we're never going to touch a title that you've put information in. So, in other words, if I said, "Look, I have." one copy each of, you know, Nightwing, A Storm in Gotham, number one and two, no freaking way do we delete that title. It's just not going to happen. It's, uh, so at that point, the title becomes kind of an orphan. It, it becomes something that we can't give you a price update for because it doesn't match our name, but, um, but it is something that you want to get rid of eventually. Now, when you've changed, you know, a series from, say, Doctor Who, you know, from being a comic to being a magazine, once you've moved over your inventory in it, if for some reason you still have that old entry in your comic base, Download the latest update. If you've got that box checked, the old title's going to go away because uh, all your new inventory is the thing that was keeping it from being deleted you know, is, is now over in the magazines now and you're good to go. Uh, wow, that's the longest answer to a question I've ever given. I'm going to try to keep these short. Uh, let's see what else we got going on here. Uh, da, 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 da. What about the black magazines? Oh, what about the old black and white magazines from the 50s, 60s, and 70s? Uh, if they ran comic stories, they're, they're, they're comics. Uh, so think about Vampirella or Creepy or things like that. Uh, those are still comics. You know, they, they told stories using panels. Um, if it's just like a black and white magazine, you know, like... Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of something like Cine Fantastique or something like that. Um, or, uh, you know, for that matter, Soldier of Fortune. I, man, somebody... I would, uh, we were just having this discussion the other day in the office. Is like, I, I would love it if somebody indexed Soldier of Fortune magazine because that would just be the coolest to see that again. I do not believe it's sold anymore. Um, but uh, there's no reason you couldn't add it to the database now. And once it's added, I, you know, we get all these little bits of history back and that'd be kind of cool. Anyway, but, but things like Cinefantastic and things like that are going to stay in magazines. The other ones, if they, again, if they told stories with comics, they're still a comic book, even if they're in magazine format. We really don't care what the binding looks like. You know, again, hardcover, big, small, you know, indifferent, you know, huge, tiny. That doesn't change what fundamentally it is, whether it fundamentally is a comic book or not. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it, the question is, does it tell a story? All right, so let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Magazines are in comic base before. You got missed out for reclassification. Yes, and by the way, if you see uh, that we have uh, not classified something under the right way, please send us a note at support at comicbase.com and just let us know. Uh, for instance, when, when we were just getting ready to ship, uh, we had to go back and find everything that's the art of this, that, and the other guy. Um, uh, we had to make it so that that became like a real comic book. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, move those from comic books to books. Uh, so yeah, please let us know when we mess those up. This is going to settle out, uh, but it's, you know, I, I do apologize because we, we do need to kind of take all those things that weren't comic books and put them where they belong now. Uh, so in our all of our individual collections, this is one of the few times when like we, there's a little bit of sorting to do. Um, all right, so let's see here. CB app helps do that. Uh, you, uh, have you thought about using the uh, the phone as a barcode reader? Absolutely. Uh, the comic based phone app will let you do that, um, but uh, it's not as good as a barcode reader. Um, 
All right, why is the phone not as good as a barcode reader? And let me, uh, let me grab a prop. Oh, by the way, special for any of you guys who are actually watching the live stream right now. Um, one of the things before I did a live stream is I had to clean up my office. Uh, another thing I had to do is take my office and rotate the entire thing 90 degrees, because otherwise what you'd be really looking at is this wall of light coming through, you know, uh, through a window behind me, which would have blinded every camera shot going. Um, uh, so anyway, in all this cleaning, and this is part of what I did during you know the whole COVID downtime, uh, we went through all the boxes and all the things that we hadn't quite filed away since moving out to, uh, to Nashville, uh, and we found some stuff that we didn't know we had. So anyway, you guys might recognize this as one of our, you know, this is like actually kind of like a Gen 2 uh, Manhattan barcode scanner. We found a bunch of these. We found uh, a, a number of other uh, barcode uh, scanners. Uh, frankly, dudes, we don't sell them anymore. They work great. They're cheap. You guys want one? Send me a note uh, 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 just after the comments. Uh, just reach out uh, pbickford at human-computing.com. I will make you a great deal on these. As long as I, I don't lose money shipping it to you, it's yours. Uh, and they do work with comic base, so there's that. Um, but anyway, back to why you'd want to use a barcode scanner as opposed to your phone. Um, okay, when you use a phone as a barcode scanner, uh, now you guys might remember the original take on our app. And what we would do is we'd have you basically take a picture of the barcode scanner, which then we would do just amazing amounts of image recognition to try to get a, a usable barcode read out of that one photo that you'd taken with your you know your your shaky cam on your whole thing it if you got really good with it it would work 70 percent of the time um we uh, the limit on that was we only had one shot at bat you know you know so however shaky your hand was at the time when you took it that's all we had to work with sometimes we had to say look we can't make anything out of this one and try it again that you know it, that wasn't great one of the things that we did that was way better with the new mobile app is we uh, added a barcode component where all we're doing is we're looking at your computer's camera, uh, your phone's camera all the time. It's, you know, you know, dozens, if not, you know, hundreds of times a second. And we're, you know, we're looking at things until we get a razor sharp image of a barcode that we can recognize, at which point, boom, we got it, go. Now, that said, what your phone's got to do to make that happen, I mean, you know, it's, it's the actual, if you were to time what's required with that is like, okay, I hold the comic book up in my hand. I get out my barcode the scanner, you know, I, I get to the right area in the whole thing where I'm scanning. I kind of hold the thing, I kind of center it on where the whole thing is. I, I pause for a second while my phone locks camera. Ideally, then it goes bip, and it pulls up the thing, it says, great, I got it, I hit add, I'm done. Now, that's not bad. It, you can do reasonable amounts of comic books with that. It's infinitely better than what we had going on before. But honestly, compared to what how fast you can go using one of these suckers it's like a t it's like 10 times slower um, uh, because uh, using a barcode scanner barcode scanners are incredibly simple uh, all they're all they're doing is literally looking for in black and white looking for little you know po uh, points of, of of light and dark contrast that's, that's all they're doing they can recognize imagery so fast uh, compared to like the, the however many megapixels your phone's camera is uh, trying to decode that image. Um, uh, they're just, just far, far faster. They bip the second they've got it. You move on to the next one. You can do batch operations with it. Um, so what I'd say is the bar, the mobile app, it's great for stuff where you're just looking up random stuff on the road. It's great if you've got a few comic books to do. It's great even if you got a box of comics to do. If I had 50 boxes of comics to do, no way would I use the bar of the phone for that. I, I would use a barcode scanner every time. Um, it, it's, it's just a physical limitation of what what the hardware is doing it's just as far as how you know how fast you can go with it so uh yes uh that's the again i'm not really picking up this pace on these i'm gonna try uh all right so uh there was the part where the peak <laughs> where's the part where peak is where free barcode scanners um all right not free like i say i'll make you a deal I, the deal does not need to be much but i do need to not lose money shipping this to you so you know if if, if you want to say 20 bucks 20 bucks it is all right so um uh lost cover dates i don't i'd have to read back on what that is um so has the, something hit the fan um i don't know man um uh, yeah on, on i'm trying to keep a level head on this whole covid stuff just in general um but man you can't look at the unemployment rates and not say like <laughs> and a lot of it we've kind of been living on you know funny money for a while because you know the government's been sending out really large checks to everyone at the start of it to keep us all from you know frankly riding in the streets um but um uh, but honestly that only ran for a certain number of months there's only a certain amount of money in the world um 
uh, I mean, you can make up more of it, but it doesn't mean that it's real. Um, but we've all been kind of buffered. It's kind of like, you know, like if you're out of college and you don't have a job and you're kind of living on your credit card, well, the first month's not bad. It's the month after that that really blows. Um, we're kind of at a point now where we've shut down everything. No one's got people walking to the restaurants. You know, their comic store foot traffic is a fraction of what it was. I don't think anyone knows what the damage is yet because the smoke hasn't lifted. Uh, I think we'll know over the next few months. I'm praying it's not that bad and we bounce back fast. But, man, I, I, I think the smoke is only starting to lift, so I, I don't really know. Um, all right, let me go back to show some comic-based stuff. Um, all right, I really hope you guys can make this out. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some build stuff. Um, all right, so when we did Comic Base 2020, we knew we were changing everything. It was literally we were rewriting the whole program from the ground up. I mean, it was 300, I keep on saying it, it was 300,000 plus lines of code that we had to go out there. And you knew, we knew there was going to be bugs, there were going to be problems. It didn't matter how long we were in testing. We had a really big beta group, which, by the way, if you're part of the beta group, man, love you guys. Uh, and you all got tour jackets, which is kind of cool. Um, but anyway, um, but we were in that for a longer than we've ever been with any release of things to knock things up. And we knew there's going to be problems. Problems. You know, as soon as we get everyone gets to try it on their own configurations that are wildly different than anyone anything that's been seen before and you really kind of start whacking at some of the different features so one of the things that we did that's different than we've done in the past is we've been putting out more or less continuous releases so whenever we find any bug uh, we basically just put out a new release uh, on uh, we you know we build out goes out to the servers on copypaste.com if you go to my account registrations you just download it again and you look at the build number which the build number is going to be that little part under help and you go to about comic base it's this part over here it's uh, this is version 20.0.2.3433 in this case which unless you download it this weekend is probably later than the one you've got right now um and it does a few little futzy things a little better than the version you've got if you download it you know before the weekend now we don't make a big deal about most of these builds because it's annoying in, in the extreme if everyone is telling you update your software every three minutes. So what we've been trying to do is make it so that we only tell you to update your software when there's something either really serious that we got to fix or when it's been a really, really long time and we just want to kind of roll up where everyone's at. And that's when we'll actually, you'll get a note when you go to download updates where it says things like, hey, you, there's new content update available, but before you do it, you got to download the latest program update, at which point you go you download the thing you install it and then it lets you move on and install things we've been really trying to minimize the number of times we do that which is why we you, you'll see this number at the end the 3433 goes up a lot and the number before it the 20.0.2 has only moved twice since we released comic base. When we change that 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 number right before it, that's when it forces everyone to do an update. We're probably going to force an update pretty soon, but it hasn't quite come out yet uh, because it gives us a chance again to throw a lot of fixes in right as we go. The people who've had a particular problem, we can tell them, hey, there's new build out, go ahead and download it, and we can not bug everybody else. Now, if you care to be bugged, uh, if you keep a look at the um, betas page on comicbase.com. If you look under support, uh, updaters, and then uh, pre-release and betas, uh, then you'll see everything that we're doing eh, within a week of when we've done it. We, we, we're pretty good at updating the page, not 100% perfect, because a lot of times we're just in the middle of you know doing things. Um, but we try to keep a list of what we've done as we go on that one pretty frequently. Um, Anyway, but uh, one of the things we slipped in here, and this comes as part of a request from a guy who I... I I really, yeah, I, I, I respect this, um, but um, uh, if you look down here at the bottom, this is a new feature. This just came in within the last week. Uh, exclude mature titles from the database. Now, what that's all about is you guys might remember if you've been with us for a while we used to have a feature uh under file file tools to remove mature readers titles what that came about is when we first did like comic base like comic base one or two uh this kid he was like 13 you know called him, like i really like comic books but uh is there a way to get rid of all the bad comics or like bad comics what are you thinking are you trying to like dc no uh no sorry i was a marvel guy at the time i, I didn't mean anything by it don't get mad uh anyway no uh he was thinking about is anything that you know had you know as as was very much uh of the time they would have you know women dressed you know uh let's say in an idealized version of the female form uh, and this thing, guy, this poor kid, I mean, my heart broke for him, was really getting, you know, stick from his mother about the whole thing. I thought, oh, man, uh, yeah, we don't have that, but we're about to. And I wrote in this feature, which allows it to remove anything that was marked as mature reader's titles. And that was great. 
until Comic Base 10 came around when suddenly we had the whole idea of automatic updates. Now, when you do an automatic update, what's really going on is you're downloading an extract of everything that's in our master database and we're comparing against what everything you've got and whatever's different gets added and everything that's di you know you know new and changed gets you know mixed and matched and, and added in so you could delete all the mature readers titles but then they just come back again on the during the next update um now in fairness you know that kid moved on i hadn't heard, heard from him in a number of years i wasn't that worried I, we had other things to worry about but eh, of late you know we've i've had a number of people approach and say like guys you know i love you guys but i'm embarrassed my wife is you know not loving that this has got a lot of you know things in it that you know I, I you know I should you know, it probably is not great for me to be looking at um, and, and honestly let's face it we have magazines in there and not all the magazines are comics okay let's just say um, so anyway even though we would have the thing where we put little red ribbons over all the naughty bits and everything else like that the guy was worried and so I thought okay fine that, that's a completely fair thing we've got a little time on our hands and so over the uh, I, I, it was either this weekend or the last one uh, I wrote in something which finally did what we should have done a decade ago uh, which is to say not just get rid of them but it, it excludes them from coming back so if you're of a mode where you want to get rid of mature readers titles from your database uh, go ahead and just when you download an update click this one if it's the first time you've done it you'll get a warning saying hey this is going to remove everything that you don't have in stock remember we're never going to throw out stuff that you have listed as i i own it but it'll remove that from the database and it won't come back uh, you know not unless you uncheck it and then download it again so that's a thing uh can i save a report to the web and give it a name like superman's comics or george perez books no but I want to make that happen. Um, that's absolutely great question. That was from George. Um, let's see here. Um, Barco, does it? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, there was one... <laughs> Sensuous Street Review Magazine, not a comic, even though it came out from Marvel. Um, I don't know much about that one, but that's a fair question. I'm going to have to look into that one. Um, okay, so... <laughs> Anyway, uh, let me hit one or two more questions that came in from the, uh, from the, holy cow, time has flown. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make this really quick. Um, so a couple of questions that people asked beforehand. I'm, I'm trying to be better about answering questions people ask during the scroll. Um, but um, what is we go. Uh, so Bruce asks, how do we scan and submit wraparound covers? Um, uh, so a wraparound cover is basically just a comic book where it's got one image on the front. And that image continues to the back. Uh, yeah, so they're cool. Um, and we kind of worked out a, a way of dealing with these, I don't know, a while back. Uh, more or less hit on the idea of what you do is you scan the front. You move the canvas over in your in Photoshop or whatever else. You scan the back. You merge the two together. You send us one big picture. Um, it winds up being more squarish or more of a low rectangle than before. But you know, if you look and you uh, see some of those ones, uh, and I th I want to say like the official handbooks of the Marvel Universe had a lot of wraparounds. So let me let me go ahead and pull those up. Uh, official handbook of the Marvel Universe. Yeah, sure. Here we are. Um, so if you look down here, you'll see that this is the wraparound cover uh, for the whole thing. And when you see it, it displays on the whole thing. We print it on a label or do things like that. It'll show you the whole cover. Uh, and cool thing also is when you click on it, you see the whole cover in a large. Uh, but that's how you do it. Um, basically, just merge it together into one file. Name that file as, you know, just whatever the comic book is, 1.jpg. Dump it in your copy. Click on it. Right click. Say submit new or corrected data to us. If it's a picture we haven't seen before, it'll send it to us, and you're good to go. All right, and let's see here. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to get to Elodie's question later on, because it's too long to read right now. Uh, I guess one more, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Dan says, I have a computer with a very small hard drive, but I do have an SSD. Can I save the pictures to the SSD? That is a great, great question um, uh, and a great idea. Um, you guys might have noticed that we do a lot of stuff with pictures. Um, they come up everywhere. We print them on labels. We print them on reports. Moving the pictures to an SSD is one of the best things you can do to make your whole thing faster. Now, the very best thing you can do, uh, and, and for you guys who don't know what an SSD is, SSD is a solid state disk drive. Uh, it's basically 
It's basically using uh, um, not it's called non-volatile computer memory, but it's memory that doesn't lose its state when you turn off the power to it. Um, but it's using that in the place of what a uh, disk drive would have done in order to store your data. So uh, what you're doing then is um, uh, these came along, God, I want to say about a decade ago, but they used to be just crazy expensive, and now they're not bad at all. Now you can get a decent one for 50 bucks. Um, but what you do is these install in a typical hard drive bay. They, they're they about the size of a pack of cards, but they have standard connectors on them for the most part. There's more exotic types. That actually, uh, they mount on, uh, they're called uh, NVMe drives. They mount like a chip on your on your mother's board if you have a, a really recent computer. And those ones, by the way, are crazy fast. Uh, but they typically, uh, they take the disk speed out of the equation for, for using the program. Um, disk is what you're going to be spending most of your time, you, you know, doing when you do any database. It's mostly looking, you know, pounding your computer's hard disk. By This is like the single biggest thing you can do to make your computer faster when you're using a database program. It, don't buy more memory. Don't get a better graphics card. Don't get a better processor. Get an SSD. It's just night and day. And your computer goes from like booting in two minutes to booting in like 10 seconds or 20 seconds. It's, it's crazy what a difference these make so yes do do that uh anything you move a lot yeah move to the ssd if you got the room for it uh and but even better than that if you, you know more important than moving the uh, the pictures to the ssd move uh your database to the ssd because uh, you know, the difference again of, of just you know people you know uh, sometimes say like oh, i click the titles list and it takes 10 seconds to go and it's like man it doesn't take 10 seconds to go even on my 10 year old computer with an ssd you know um because how fast it can move using that versus using especially like an older slower laptop hard drive night and freaking day uh now how do you move your pictures to the ssd is the last question and i'm gonna wrap her up uh what you're gonna do is um now there's two ways to get here there's kind of like the you know, there's, there's like the direct but bad way because we made install pictures and movies uh we made that uh, kind of like a one-shot command over here in order to simplify our startup instructions but i'm going to get to it a slightly different way which is go to file tools and let me bring this onto the right monitor, uh, and then go to Manage Pictures and Movies, which then, let me move this onto the right monitor as well. Uh, and what you would do is change your location for pictures and movies to a folder that's on your SSD. You literally just click this little button over here, it'll ask you where you want to put it, choose a location that's on your SSD. Uh, don't choose on the top level, by the way, that's another thing that comes up, is Windows to keep us all safe, because that's working great. Um, uh, has locked down uh, the permissions on a lot of the top levels of your directories. You, you can't you can't write files to the top level of a directory or to certain folders like your system or your program uh, uh, files uh, folders with the same freedom you can anywhere else on your computer. So if you're ever getting like uh, you know permission errors or uh, this is locked errors or things like that, make sure you're not writing to one of those special folders. Uh, but basically, create a folder that's on you know like one level down on your SSD. Move your stuff there. Uh, if you move your pictures there, or if you install them off the disks to there, uh, then it's going to um, uh, then it's going to copy the stuff there. And when you start up Comic Paste the next time, you will see that everything just gets really, really fast. Uh, so yeah, great question. Okay, let, let me check things one last time. Uh, show the monitor, please. Yes. Thank you, Steve. Keep me honest. <laughs> Yeah, so what I'm talking about again is this is Manage Pictures and Movies. You get to it by going File, then File Tools, clicking Manage Pictures and Movies. All right, you're going to change the location over here, uh, and you're going to, again, set it to some a level on your SSD, not the top level. Just make a new folder called, like, Comic Base Stuff or something. Um, uh, set there and install to it, and then uh, your stuff will all get very fast. All right. Uh, and uh, D. Perry says, I can't see your screen. I hope you can see it now, because I'm looking at the program output, and it, well, it's, it's what it's got. I'm going to work on that magnifier thing. We'll figure it out. Um, anyway, guys, thanks so much for joining us. Um, this went a little longer than I want. I'm going to try to keep these ones closer to the half hour mark, but as long as it's useful to you guys, you know, we're going to keep doing it. Uh, I will see you all next Wednesday. Please, as they say, like and subscribe. So, I mean, if look, if you hated it, you don't need to like it because you didn't like it. Yeah, I'm not trying to farm votes, but if you did like it, it, uh, uh, it does actually help uh, make these things findable by other people if you found this useful. Uh, so hit the like button. 
Uh, and also, if you hit subscribe, then if we uh, do a next one, uh, we're planning on doing one next Wednesday at the same time. But whenever we do them, you'll get notified when there's new stuff posted to the channel. And another thing we're doing is we're taking content from the old Comic Base TV channel and we're moving it over to this channel. And we have some new ideas from other things we want to post. So if you subscribe to the Comic Base TV channel, you'll get notified about all that stuff. Guys, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and we'll see you next time.